Okay. Well, we stopped in verse number 10. And last week we talked about uh, Christ going in through Samaria, which was not the traditional Jewish uh, trajectory to go to Galilee from Jerusalem or vice versa. And so Christ is intentionally, and I, let me just run through this here. I have a, an outline that I have made. Um, and let me go through those. Just if you've already written them down, fine. If you haven't written them down yet, there's seven parts to this chapter I'd like us to look at. The first is John 4, 1 through 3. And that's an intentional exit. And then the second one, which is just all part of this, no verses in particular, is an intentional contrast. We talked about the contrast between chapter 3 and chapter 4. Um, number 3 is John 4, 4 through 26, which we are endeavoring to cover now. And that's an intentional encounter. And number five is John 4, 27 through 38. And that's an intentional exhortation. And then in John 4, 39 through 42, which is point um, five, is an intentional extension. And that's John 4, 39 through 42. And then the sixth and last, I'm sorry, I said seven points and it's six. The sixth and last point is John 4, 43 through 54, and that's an intentional efficacy. So obvious, I'm making it clear that there is an intentionality in Christ's movement. And we talked about this last week. We talked about the fact that Christ was very intentional in his movement. When it says that he had to travel through Samaria, he did not have to travel through Samaria um, because the Jews mostly walked around Samaria. But in this instance, because of Christ's mission, he had to travel through Samaria. And it's important for us to pick up on that, to understand that, that his, his mission is not, his mission is to do the will of the Father. And so he is led through Samaria and he's, led to this well and then interestingly enough he sends his disciples out to the community to get food now this is interesting because none of these disciples would have had any kind of one-on-one -on -one contact with samaritans and we talked about that so christ is intentionally sending the disciples out to gather food in a situation that will make them interact with people who they have learned to hate. So that, that's very, I, there's so much of this, I don't want us to miss any of the facets of this chapter and what is happening and what, what God is doing. So, it says that um, Jesus was worn out. This is in verse six. He was worn out from his journey. And we talked last week about that, the humanity of Christ. For God to experience physical 
exhaustion. That's an interesting thing. But again, we know that Hebrews tells us that Christ has endured all the things that we have endured and yet has been able to manage to overcome life's situations without sin. And we talked about that last week, how often our, our, our suffering or our uncomfortability can lead us to sin. How do you respond when things don't go your way? How do you respond? You know, uh, we, we pretty much finished the inside of the remodel on our house. We're, by the end of this week, we'll be done with the guest bathroom and the entire inside of the house. Every room, every wall, every floor will have been remodeled. And so we've now started... Um, to do the backyard and so my son was over helping today the painter that we had who painted the house the outside of the house left a bunch of uh garbage bags and so jacob went to pick up the garbage bags and he's taking it across the tile across the aggregate on the pool around the pool to the side yard to where the garbage is. And he doesn't see what he's doing, but he's spilling paint everywhere. Now, this really was the fault of the painter. He was supposed to take his garbage and he did. But Jake wasn't paying attention to what he was doing. <laughs> and I was working on, we have an old jacuzzi and rather than throw it away, because the electronics were so good and the engine was so good, I've remodeled the outside of the jacuzzi to make it look brand new again. I gave it a whole different look. It's kind of, kind of neat actually. And I was just finishing that up when I turned around and saw this trail of <laughs> like, ah! <laughs> And at first I was really like upset. Why? Because I'm trying to get this house in order and the opposite is happening. You, you will, you'll notice that when you get angry, the reason you get angry is because your will is not being done. And that's, that's something to remember. You know, we respond in anger when our will is not being done. And so um, I had to take a step back for a second and go, okay, you know, whatever. And we handled it, we cleaned it up. But um, how we respond in times of trial or frustration reveals really how much we, we trust God. It really does. It's very easy to give, you know, to have these platitudes and to uh, say, oh, I trust the Lord. But what happens when things don't go your way? What happens when your plans are fouled up? How do you respond to it? That, see, that is the indicator of really where you are in your spiritual maturity. How do you handle disappointment? How do you handle inconvenience? How do you handle suffering? Very important. Christ was able to endure all of that and, and yet he didn't sin. Now, why? Because he's God. He doesn't have the fallen sin nature. That's the point. 
but it's also should be for us a realization that as believers, we are promised through the Holy Spirit to be able to develop a sanctified character in order for us to deal with disappointment and trials in our lives so that we can reflect the character of Christ. So it is important. Yeah, you can say, well, you know, Jesus was God, you know, whatever. But no, we can't let ourselves off the hook like that because all of us are called to a spiritual maturation. We should be growing up. Uh, there's times, honestly, there's times when I look at my life and I go, holy cow, I'm 55 years old and I'm still a child. Ridiculous. I should re be responding better at this point in my life to things. But that, it's important. I mean, why does John write that there, that Jesus is worn out? I mean, this is all very intentional. Remember now that John is writing this gospel because he is refuting the heresy of the Gnostic teachings that are creeping into the church. And the Gnostic teachings stated Jesus wasn't human. He came, he was a spirit. He, he never came in human flesh. Well, this statement contradicts that when you say he's worn out and tired. Spirits don't get worn out and tired. Physical people. So everything that John is saying here is very intentional to communicate to us the actual nature of, of, of Christ in the hypostatic union. And that, that word, here's our, our term to learn for the day, hypostatic union. It means Jesus was fully God and fully man. Now, when I was doing my, um, what do they call it? Uh, was it? It was for my licensing. Uh, oh, darn, I hate when I lose words, but I had to go before a panel of pastors and professors in order to, I had written a theological paper defending my personal theology, um, and in order to be licensed to be a pastor, I had to do this, uh, ordained, ordination. Um, so it was about a three or four hour videotaped grilling of me presenting my paper and defending my theology. And in one, at one point, there was a pretty heated exchange between me and a, and a uh, Christian counselor um, who said that, uh, you know, Jesus was actually tempted to sin by Satan during the temptation and I said no you're misunderstanding the word temptation there I could hold a plate of deep fried doggy doo doo in front of you and say hey why don't you try some now I may be trying to tempt you but are you tempted no, you're like, that's disgusting. Get it away from me. I'm not tempted at all. That was the temptation of Christ. See, Christ, when Satan was tempting Jesus, when he said, eat this, uh, turn these stones into bread, Jesus, on the one hand, knew hunger and wanted to eat. But was he ever, did he ever consider in his heart the idea of thwarting God's timing and turning that bread into stone or that stone into bread. No, he didn't. He didn't. Because why? Jesus did not have the sin nature. Okay. Let, let's just, I know that I'm digressing a little bit in the last week, but I didn't cover this. This is 
horribly important for you to understand this, okay? Jesus was 100% man and 100% God in the hypostatic union. But he did not have the sin nature. What does the book of James say in James chapter 1? God does not sin, nor can he be tempted with sin. So if Jesus is God, he cannot be tempted. With, why? Because he doesn't have the fallen nature. That's the whole point. If you believe that Jesus had the fallen sin nature, then you have to believe that we have a Savior enthroned in heaven right now who still has the sin nature. Okay, it, th this is so important, you guys, that I know for some, it may think, well, you know, uh, you know, Tony, come on, you're just kind of getting, you're waxing theological on us here. No, this is important. It's important because how, look, how you, what you understand in regards to the character of Christ and his identity, that is going to inform your faith. And it's going to inform how you witness. And also, it's going to inform how you deal with false teaching. This is, this is very important stuff. And I think that's, yes, yeah, someone just to say something. Yeah, I just have a question on that thought. So would you say that, um, I never really thought about it this way, but... Wait, are, is what you're trying to say is that Jesus felt everything that that we felt, but he was just going to suffer it because there's just no way he would have fallen for Satan's ploys. And was Satan just did he not does he not know Jesus very well, or was he just like you know having a, a good time smirking at his weakness? Or not his weakness, but his suffering. Well, you're, you're right in that. See, Jesus' human side, he knew tiredness, fatigue, um, sadness, pain. But in his God side, he was never tempted to sin. It's impossible. It was impossible for Jesus to sin. So when the Bible says he he endured everything that we endure, he did. But yet he did it without sin. Because he's God. Now, as far as Satan goes, you got to remember that Satan has deceived himself. Satan is the father of sin. And sin is deception. Satan, Satan is his own biggest victim. He's deceived himself into thinking that somehow he can win. Tony? Yes. <clears throat> so Jesus, without the sin nature, could it be because that he was conceived through the by the Holy Spirit, not through a human seed? Right. He was born of a woman, but he did not have the sperm of Adam, which carries, remember when we talked in Romans 5, mm -hmm. what we call the Federalist argument, that mm -hmm. through the seed of Adam, the sin nature is carried. Correct. So God was conceived of the whole, or Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, therefore he was not conceived in such a way as to have the sin nature. Mm -hmm. Sounds reasonable. It's very reasonable once you think about it, but I'm going to tell you that a lot of Christians think that when Jesus was tempted, he was actually considering sin, and he never considered it. And people say, well, well, that's not fair. That's kind of stacking the deck. Amen! That's what I need. I need a Savior that can stack the deck for me. I don't need a Savior that might fail.
I need a savior that can't fail. So it's, it's very important, but you, you guys, I'm going to tell you, you'll be surprised how many Christians that you talk to do not understand this concept. And yet it's, it's an extremely important concept when you're dealing with the divinity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, and the hypostatic union. So two questions I have. One is, um, what was the purpose of the temptation? And the second one was, if Christ endured or he was human in every way, yet he wasn't in the sense that we are able to, I mean, he was obviously because that's what the Bible says, but how does it, we're tempted, we can be tempted and yet he can't. And so did he really experience all that we experience? He did. He experienced the suffering of hunger, of pain, of sorrow, yet he had no response or ability to respond in a sinful way because he was God. So he really didn't. See, he here's didn't the really... argument. See, Cindy, here's the argument of, of what we call freedom. Okay. Some people say in order to be free, you have to be able to sin. No, that's not true. That's, 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 a, that's a horrible definite. Sin is a defect. Yeah. So freedom, the biblical definition of freedom is the inability to sin. When Jesus says, I have come to set you free, he's saying, I'm going to bring you to a place where eventually you will not have the ability to sin. I see. Sin is a defect. Sin is a negative. Sin is a negative mutation of the human spirit and soul. There's nothing good about it. There's nothing free about it. There's nothing positive about it. It's all bad. It's defective. It's, it's imperfect. If you were to get in the bondage. If you were to get a vehicle, my son had to take his car. He just bought a, a car and he had he hasn't even paid the first payment on it. He had to take it in. Okay. And he said, well, what's better? To have a vehicle that can't break down or a vehicle that can. And that's the whole issue here, the whole topic of freedom that we need to recapture and, and bring the idea of freedom back into a biblical concept of what freedom is. Because God is truly free because he is free of the defect of sin. We are not truly free because we are under the bondage and defect of sin. So that's, see, that's where we have to be careful in our culture today, where the culture tries to say that freedom allows me to be gay or straight or trans or whatever. That's freedom. No, it's not. That is a negative mutation of your soul. Are, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So I would add to that. Do, do you then also think that it means that if you don't sin, in other words, I'm trying to think of how I want to word this. Do you feel like um, it's, it's a freedom to choose without being part of sin? In other words, like... You know, you you um, you can make choices, almost like um, because you're here on Earth. You know, there's this sin, like the Garden of Eden. There were all these options, and there was a lifestyle and all this, but there was no sin. The Garden of, uh, sin was brought in by, well, the punishment of sin, like you described, the defect, was because it was against the law of God. So in a way, you're saying that the Lord 
is free of the laws of God because he basically makes the laws. And there, if there's no law, then there's no sin, basically. Or, well, it's, or there's no... Yeah, it, it's not so much that God is free of his laws, but his laws express his character and who he is. So God does not have to strain to keep his laws because his laws reflect his actual identity. Just like you, when you walk by an apple tree, you don't hear it straining to produce apples. It produces apples simply because it's an apple tree. Right. And the issue of freedom, and this is very important, you do not have free will until you're saved. Now, this is another theological division between a lot of churches today, churches that say, oh, no, you choose God. You choose to be saved. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, no man can come to the Son unless the Father draws him. All that God has given to me, I will keep. May God grant them faith and repentance. So the issue of free will is, that as an unbeliever, you have no free will. You cannot choose to honor God or obey God because as Romans 5 clearly says, you're hostile to God. It's not until Jesus sets you free that now you actually have free will. Now each morning when you rise, you can either choose to honor God in your living or honor the flesh. You didn't have that choice before you were saved. This is very important if we're going to understand how salvation works and the sovereignty of God. That's very thought-provoking. Super, super, super important. And all of this, you guys, doesn't come out of here. It comes out of here. This is simply every, you notice that everything I said, Anne, I said it with a verse to back it up. Yes. Okay, because the fact is, this theological teaching that we choose God and God doesn't choose us is, is, is not the way to think about salvation. That's why you have these mega churches that are trying to have big rock bands and lights and music because they think they can convince someone to walk down that aisle. No, only God can call someone to salvation. Only God can grant them faith and grant them repentance. Only he saves. That's why salvation is 100% a work of God. And we don't need a big rock band or fancy buildings or lights. All we need to do is read the gospel and preach it and let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. And if more churches would do that, instead of trying to manipulate people, they would not fall into the heresies and false teachings that they have fallen into. But that... Is where we're at in America today. Tony? Yes. I have a question. Okay, back to the um, the temptation of Jesus, right? Um, so I'm thinking that maybe another way to describe that, okay, he's perfect God and he, he's God and holy God and holy man, right? So if he got tempted... And he was feeling like, okay, I'm really, really hungry. I really would like this, right? But he has, a ch when we're saved, you could, he can't sin, right? But he's, you know, he's can feel the pain, right? But yeah, to be God hunger. would be, he, he, he can feel the what? Hunger, but the thought would never cross his mind to go against the will of the Father. Right, so he can feel the pain. It could be a lot of the things. He could be, you know, that like the cross. He's tortured, but he and he wants to get out of there. But he's God, and he, so he's not going to. But in a way, that's kind of like winning over the enemy, over the temptation, over or, or, over the pain and everything. Right. So that's how we all wish we could be. Right. Well, we yeah, all wish we could go through the worst stuff and. 
be okay. Well, you know, and survive it in a good way, right? Listen, that's that's the hope. But listen, uh, Cindy, I did not answer your question. Why then did Jesus go through the temptation? Okay, remember now that Adam. Okay, he went through the temptation for a few reasons. One, I will say for the Garden of Eden, and two, I will say for the Jews going through the wilderness. Okay, they were 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness. Now, remember, I've said before that now, and it not by coincidence, not by coincidence, that first John um, two says this. Um, do not love the world or the things in the world if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him for everything in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life in one's possessions is not from the father but is from the world and the world with its lusts is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. So, Cindy, to answer your question, Eve saw that the fruit um, was good for food, lust of the flesh. She saw that it was pleasing to the eye, lust of the eyes, and she saw that it was good to make one wise, pride of life. Jesus saw the bread as being good for food. Look, Satan said, eat it and be filled. Lust of the flesh. Then he took him and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, these can be yours. Lust of the eyes. And then he took him to the pinnacle and said, throw yourself down and God's angels will lift you up and everyone will worship you. Pride of life. That's why. That's why. Because Jesus had to correct every failure that Adam and Eve made and every failure that Israel made going through the wilderness in their lust of the flesh, their lust of the eyes, and in their pride of life. Does that make sense? Yes. Cindy, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> the lust of, uh, or I'm sorry, the the Israel going through the wilderness, can you um, delineate the three different lust of the flesh with them? Sure. Uh, at, at one point, at one point they say, oh, it, you know, in, in, in Egypt, we had, um, in Egypt, we had all of these things, lust of the flesh. Ah. And then as they're going and, and setting their eyes on Jericho and on um, and on the promised land, all the good things that they could have had and they decide not to have. But not only that, but the fact that what happens is when they go in, when, when uh, Moses goes up into the mountain to meet with God, what happens to them is they take all the jewelry and make their own God, le the lust of the eyes. Ah. And then finally declare, this is the God that took us out of Egypt. This is the God that will bring us the pride of life, a God that we created ah. with our own jewelry. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Look, I, I'm going to tell you that these three bases, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, folks, that is at the core of your sin nature as well. Think about it. What are the areas that you fail when you want to fulfill your flesh. <clears throat> when you look at something and you want it in your eyes or when your ego gets attached or attacked and you want it, it's there. It's there. So all of those things, in fact, if you want to get more philosophical about it, and I realize we may never get to, to verse 11, <laughs> But if you want to look at it this way, too, in this culture of ours, there are three 
philosophies. There is uh, pragmatism. There is um, materialism. And there's utilitarianism. Those three isms operate our culture. Pragmatism, materialism, and utilitarianism. Jesus, so, uh, Satan said, look, eat this food and you can be filled. Materialism. Then he takes the, him on, uh, on the, the, uh, the, pil the, uh, the pillar and says, cast yourself down. Look, just jump. And it, it, everyone will see you're the Messiah. Pragmatism. Makes sense. Be practical. Be pragmatic. Jump. Angels come. Everyone in the... See, the pinnacle, by the way, the pinnacle is where the high priest went to blow the trumpet to call everyone to prayer. So when Jesus goes on the pinnacle, everyone's going to see him. And when he jumps and angels... That's it. Oh, he's the Messiah. Pragmatism. Then, who can tell me what the definition of utilitarianism is? Anyone? I'll give you a, I'll give you a double gold star. If you can <laughs> tell me. And no looking up on Google. Yeah, Pat. <laughs> You're busted. <laughs> I saw you looking there. Okay. Uh, um, how I about know what things it is. that are useful? What's that? Things that are useful. No. No. Okay. <laughs> that, that's not the definition of utilitarianism. Maybe the belief that things should be kept and handled according to usefulness. No. Okay, here it is. You're, you're going to recognize it as soon as I say it. The definition of utilitarianism is the end justifies the means. Well, that's useful. <laughs> okay, the end just When Satan took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, he said, I'll give them to you. Just bow down and worship me. Hey, the ends justify the means. You'll get what you want. You'll get the world. So even however you want to look at it, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, or mod in our modern view of materialism, pragmatism, and utilitarianism, Jesus showed the way out. And again, all of this is really important for us to understand if we're going to understand the identity of Christ. Can you um, go back just a second to the um, to when you said we cannot sin in heaven where there is no choice. We cannot sin. And is it because we are now whole because our spirit is no longer defective? So we would look at sin the same way that Jesus would look at sin as as not something that we could do. Yeah, it's because you remember now that the imputation, our sins were put on Christ and his righteousness was put on us. Mm -hmm. And so the time will come when our physical bodies will get a new body. And in that new body will not be the sin nature. We will have the nature of Christ. His righteousness. We will be unable to sin. But our inability won't come out of a robotic um, response, right? Our inability will come out of our actual nature and character. Mm -hmm. And we get that new nature when we become believers? We do. And we, we're striving towards that new nature, even though we fail horribly a lot of times. But we have the ability to strive for it. We strive to act out who we are. 
Yeah, we yeah we desire to act out our identity as believers. And Adam and Eve, they did not have that righteousness. I mean, they were not um, morphed into um, being. They did have the ability to sin. Yeah. And they had it because. Because they weren't God. Right. But we won't have the ability to sin and we're not God either. In heaven. That's right. But. The, but because of Christ's death, his righteousness has been imputed unto us. You, you got to understand, folks, okay, this is really, I want everyone looking at me now. Come on. I see people looking down. Look at me when you, I want you to understand this. Okay. God is not trying to get us back to the Garden of Eden. God is bringing us way past the Garden of Eden. The, a great miracle was the physical creation of Adam. But a greater miracle is the new birth, the spiritual creation of man. God's plan for man didn't, it didn't end at the Garden. That was just the beginning. But here's, here's the thing. Anything that God creates is going to fall unless God sustains it. Why? Because God cannot recreate himself. There's only one God. So how do you save and keep a perfect people? You impute and bring them into yourself. You give them your character through your Holy Spirit. You adopt them as your children. And they share that DNA, not that they're divine, but that your divine spirit lives in them. It's very important to understand the concept of that. What God is doing. He's not trying to bring us back to the Garden of Eden. Oh, please don't bring me back because I'll be the first one to take a bite of the fruit again. Tony, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you, do you have any thoughts on, on this same topic of, so, so Satan, and I know we're, we're not to know everything, but Satan being deceived himself and fallen uh, with a third of the angels, right? Um, away from, from God. Um, and then here we're created and we also are deceived ourselves because of our sinful natures apart from God. Like you were saying, we can do nothing good apart from accepting Jesus. Um, and that, um, just the relationship between that. I mean, is it God saying, I'm going to give them choice there. They can't do this. Um, but they're my children when they accept, as they accept Jesus Christ, my son who has to pay. It's just, you know, I'm, you, you know what I'm trying to say? Like the relationship between Satan falling with a third of the angels, him creating us, knowing that we're going to be deceived as well, just like Satan was deceived, but he wanted to give us free choice. Uh, I mean, God's, God's plan was that he would create us and that he knew we would fall. And it would be stupid to say that wasn't part of his plan. It would be dishonest. God's plan was for Satan to be a useful idiot. And I don't say that in a disrespectful way to Satan because he's an amazing foe and quite strong. But what I'm saying is that God's full intention was to use Satan for his glory. And every being that's been created, saved or unsaved, angelic or demonic, will exist for eternity for God's glory. Wow. I never heard it that way. Um, 
that's a whole different way of me thinking because I always thought you know and Satan where did he come from you know God is God he's everything but how did Satan fall Satan, well, see, everything that God creates is going to fall unless God sustains it through his grace. And this is the important lesson, folks. Guess what? You're not God. The whole fall proves we're not God. And that the only way we can be redeemed is to be sustained through God's grace, through his son. Satan was not sustained, but two thirds of the angels, God, and he calls them, what, is, what does the Bible say? His elect angels. So God sustained them and kept them from falling. So wh whatever God creates is only not going to fall if he sustains it and keeps it from falling. He's not obligated to keep you from falling. He can allow you, like Romans 1 says, he can hand you over to a depraved mind because your natural inclination would be to sin. I mean, obvious, look, folks, before Adam ever ate that fruit, there were horrible thoughts going through Adam's mind. Or that, would have ne that whole scenario would have never happened. Adam literally used his wife as an experiment to see if God's word was true and what he could get away with. That's why Eve was not condemned for willful disobedience. Adam was. One of these days we need to go through Genesis. <laughs> <clears throat> Great book. Great book. So uh, the uh, between God and the um, Satan, right? It's not a it's not a dualism, right? It's not like here's God and then here's Satan. No. They're they're competing, you know. Yeah, I think a lot I used, of. I used to tell my kids, you know, it's not like here's God and here's Satan. <sighs> Yeah. It's more like it's more like this. Here's God. Here's Satan. Yeah. That's what it's like. In fact, when Satan gets thrown into hell, God doesn't do it. He sends some angel, probably some angel sweeping the throne room floor to go toss him into hell. Like Satan is not Darth Vader. <laughs> right? No, Satan is Satan has you you can't even compare. Satan to God in any way. This is not dualism here. It's not yin and yang here. Mm -hmm. and he sure he sure has a lot of damage going on. Well, yeah, our soul us, personally and for, for the us, world. My God, for us, Satan is a, 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 a huge foe, and to be disrespectful of Satan's power of deception would be stupid and prideful. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about how does Satan compare to God? He, he's, he's, he's like the gum under God's shoe. And that's just the truth of it. Yeah, don't give Satan too much credit. People do. And that was one of the things when I was on the ship with um, Pat that used to drive me nuts. The people were more obsessed with demon stories and Satan stories than they were with the sanctifying power of Jesus Christ. And that used to drive, I used to sit there, what does this have to do with the gospel? I mean, this is nothing, it started to resemble to me sitting around the campfire telling spooky stories to entertain each other. <laughs> really? Yeah, but Tony, they were really good stories, don't you think? Good story. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say really quick, um, you know, I was a charismatic and um, I eventually read the book of Jude. And um, that's the book that confronted me on the whole issue of when we as believers or charismatic believers, Pentecostal believers, we, we rebuke Satan and we do it with such 
animosity and disrespect. And Jude showed how, you know, even what Michael, I think, yeah, would say the Lord rebuke you. He wouldn't even do it. And we, we don't understand what we're, uh, what we're speaking against or what we're coming up against when we do stuff like that. It, it really is kind of like an adolescent teenage thing to do. So a lot of people talk about spiritual battles. So is this is this a misterm, a misterminology? And no, I, I think that that we are involved in spiritual warfare. I think without a spiritual doubt. warfare, yeah. Um, but I think to understand the context of spiritual warfare and understand the definition of it and actually what it means, it may be a whole different ball game. Yeah. I don't know. I think you're. I think you. Good point. I don't think it's a small thing at all. I mean, Jesus ran across demons and I mean, they just came out of the woodwork. It was like, you know, kind of like a Linda Blair movie or something. And um, if that happened when he was walking the earth, I think there is quite the spiritual battle. I think, I think Satan and his minions are definitely out there. I don't think it's I think it changes with the ages, much like um, it looked different in the Old Testament as it did when Christ was on earth. It looked different in the, after, you know, the, after the, uh, the day of Pentecost, the days of Pentecost had arrived and the new church was getting initiated. It looked yet different again as you read history, you read Christian history and you hear what was really going on, some of the seasons really changed quite radically so i think there's a season for thing much much like there was a season for um you know christ's return and and just you know kind of like the ecclesiastics there's um a time for all things so i i think we have reached a time where i would agree with patrick i was i was actually on the pentecostal track myself at one time and i I've radically changed my view of that even in the last two years after watching the kind of weird things that have happened on earth. I think the Bible is the ultimate authority and we are in an era where the Bible is so important and um, waiting for the voice of the Lord, which I spent years doing that. Um, let me tell you, I was, I wrote essays on it. I, I read books on it. I, um, I'm very, I, I don't have anything negative to say to people who are, who are a lot, are kind of on the charismatic bent, but I mean, I, I would, I would discourage them because I think we, we are in a different era, a different type of battle. And I think it's been there for a while. And I think we need the Bible as the foundational voice of the Lord. Anyway. Yeah. I agree, but I, I also think I also think that we are on the the uh, cusp of a major supernatural invasion. Um, I think we're going to begin to see demonic activity like we've never seen before. I think we're seeing it already <laughs> among our homeless um, in our mental institutions, which we write off as mental illness, um, but a lot of it is satanic oppression. Um, I think it's very, and I'm just going to throw it, this is my opinion. Um, when you hear very reputable newscasters showing videos of lights in the skies and all this stuff, and the, the U.S. Air Force now coming out going, we don't know what's going on. I do think there's demonic activity as we enter into the last times. Um, the issue, though, is do we do we focus on that demonic activity or do we focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ? The gospel. Yeah. Because and that's the one thing that that's the one thing I was seeing and on the ship was that everyone seemed to be focused on what Satan was doing, not what God was doing. Can I add that um, we in America are, and this is kind of as it related to Anne, what you said, we in America are in a particular journey in our culture, but other cultures around the world are seeing much different activity because they, they well, they just are. And it relates to what the journey of their culture is. And so 
we think, oh, it's all just, you know, starting, but we're only looking at our culture as the reference for it. But yet it's, it isn't just starting now because we're Americans, it's starting, right. it has already started for years and years in other places. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that, Cindy. I, I, I think it's, I guess I should say it's becoming more obvious to us as Americans as we enter into a pagan society, as we leave and become a post-Christian culture, um, we're going to see more, uh, more and more of this. So, okay, it's 8.06 right now. Uh, first of all, let me apologize to you guys. I never got to verse 11. Um, maybe we'll just, uh, Pat, we can call this a uh, seminar on the nature of Christ <laughs> or something. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, you know, guys, I, I, I study uh, and I really want to be disciplined as we go through this, but I think sometimes there are issues that, that come up and I want to be, I do want to be sensitive to the spirits leading. Oh, oh yeah, no, Tony. I don't think you have to apologize for anything. Yeah, I just you know, I, I I do want to be disciplined and honor your time, but I do think that yeah, it's just super important because um, I take very seriously this group. Um, I think that um, I think that we are here for a reason, all of us. That God has brought us here for a reason. And I take very seriously the purity of theology and scripture and the gospel. And I do think that God is preparing us for what we are entering into right now. So, and I'm thankful for all of you guys to come and do this. You're, you're never a burden to me. Um, I never go, oh, gee, I got to do this tonight. I always look forward to it. I feel that, um, I could never deserve the honor of speaking God's word to you. It's God's grace that allows me to do so. So there you go. Well, thank you, Tony, for um, just, I'm sure you have years of, of study in the word and how you are eloquently able to quote scripture in our, with our questions. So thank you. You're welcome. I, I do want to mention that that Pat and I really want to, to, to do a, uh, what we call a pre-trip into Tijuana, Mexico, um, because I am hoping to revive a ministry that Marlis and I, Marlis, are you there? You can unmute yourself if you're there. Um, that Marlis and I were, uh, there she is. Um, that Marlis and I, started together and uh, put a lot of work into and we are I'm hoping to revive that ministry in the Tijuana I know the COVID thing is killing us man it's just you know just when we get ready to go back in they start closing things again so I don't know what the deal is if Pat do you know can we go into Mexico right now I don't actually know. I mean, I've been hearing stuff in the news lately about a possible lockdown happening again. So I don't, I don't know. You could, you could come easily from the South. Oh, I'm sorry, was that Robert? I say you could come easily from the South. <laughs> it's actually harder to sneak into Mexico than it is. For yeah, I know. I know. So, yeah. <laughs> Go the other way. <laughs> Ridiculous. Um, Tony, I just went online and it says that it's close until August 21st. <sighs> okay. The border's closed. Going out, <laughs> not going in. No, both ways. Oh, both. Well, relatively speaking, it's close. Yeah. <laughs> Just find the gap in the in the fence. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see what happens. I know that there are churches over there that are suffering and need our help and our encouragement. One of the things that we did for a lot of years is we took a lot of good theological books into because a lot of the pastors there are 
influenced by the Benny Hinn Pentecostal type garbage. And we did, Marlis, wouldn't you say we had a pretty eff effective ministry in discipling those pastors into a, a biblical-based theology? I think that was huge. I mean, that's the cornerstone, right? If, if your pastor is not trained properly and theologically correct, you know, they, they just can't teach, you know, whatever's coming out of the mind, it's all, you know, garbage. And we had many of them who, you know, Tony would sit and open the Bible and show them, hey, you know, women cannot be teaching church. You know? And we look at the pastor and, and he's, and I think that one pastor, I mean, he sat there and cried with us because of just finding truth. But I don't think he changed, um, or it was a tiny church, but, you know, his wife was preaching, you know, <laughs> like, but like, we can't partner with you, you know, if this continues, you know. Um, yeah, and that's always hard to do because you want, and there was a lot of that, yeah. women pastors and that kind of thing in Mexico, and you're trying to, um, uh, and it, look, this is not a, a men versus woman issue. This is a biblical issue. And there's a reason why God has laid down things in Timothy and, and Titus and so forth regarding how the church is to conduct itself. There's a reason for it. And, um, and that, that was... That was very difficult for us to go into those situations and try to, and some of the pastors we couldn't partner with because, look, if I can bring the Bible to you and show you in black and white what the Bible says, and you can say, well, maybe it says that, but I don't like it, then you shouldn't be pastoring, period. And I'm certainly not going to partner with you on that. But, you know, Marlos and I, and so many of our, our team, had the privilege of going into pastors where their kids were just little kids. Now they're grown and married and we still have relationships with them. And, you know, it's a beautiful thing. And I'd like to reignite that again, but with this COVID thing, yeah. man, it's really affecting the freedom to move and to preach and to share the gospel in, in this country. You, you guys need to be praying for the Christians in Canada. They're having their churches burned down, and Prime Minister Trudeau thinks that's fine. He doesn't have a problem with it. And uh, pastors are being put into jail for pre. And that's Canada. Did you ever think you'd see that in Canada? No. No. It's shocking. It's shocking. Mm -hmm. There was a it's church. The house is down. What's that? Who's burning the houses down? Um, they're not sure. They're not saying. It's, it's radical people who are burning churches down. And Trudeau gets up there instead of saying this is an awful thing. He says, well, it's understandable considering Christians hor Christianity's horrible history. I remember that comment, too, and that was shocking. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Really, really shocking. But that's what I mean, you guys, when I say, you know, there's a reason we're meeting here. You know, and I, I do think that the Lord is getting us ready to stand uh, in a time of trial. I see it, it coming. And, you know, in America, we have jo enjoyed many years of freedom of religion, but this may be coming to an end for us. And remember that Christ called us to pick up our cross, which is a sign of death and torture, and follow him. So we shouldn't be surprised when our comforts of life are interrupted and we begin to have to pay the price for following him. It's been happening in so many countries and we just don't. Yeah. It just hasn't happened in ours. It hasn't happened to us, but it's been happening for 2,000 years all over the world. This is nothing new. No. Christianity is, has been, always been the most persecuted, 
people and religion in the history of the world. Now, you're not going to hear that from anyone, but it's true. So, you know, America's 5% of the world's population. So, you know, we've been living in this little Disneyland Main Street USA bubble, which is now coming to an end. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, Cindy's right. This is like, hey, there are believers all over the world going, hey, guys, guess what? You know, welcome to Christianity. Welcome to my normal. Yeah, welcome to my normal, you know? You know, we all worry, oh, oh, is there going to be a rapture? Oh, are we going to get raptured before the tribulation? There's people in Africa and in Asia and the Middle East who are being tortured to death going, tribulation, excuse me, hello? Yeah. I'm not worried about the rapture. <laughs> you know, we're in tribulation already. Mm -hmm. But Americans are, oh, I hope we're pre-trib because I don't want to have my toenails stubbed for Jesus. Yeah, well said. Very well. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Tony, this article I looked up is 56 churches in Canada that have been burnt. 56 churches in Canada. And have you heard any of this on the news in America? No. 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 Not really. You have to dig for it. Yeah. Yeah, you have to dig for it. Um, <clears throat> I, I kind of want to go back just for one question, um, to our study and, and the question I had was if, okay, it makes total sense to me that God doesn't want us to go back to Eden because Eden was, it's going to be something far better than that. But, um, why did Adam and Eve, what, what were their purpose? Was their purpose to fall? Huh. Yes. And, and then with that being said, why would theologically, if it's known, why would God not uh, create Adam and Eve with a kind of um, I guess the word isn't perfection, but the, the kind of righteousness. Well, why didn't God sustain them in his grace from falling? Yes, yes. Because yes. it was not his plan to do so. Yeah, okay. Look, at God's plan is not about exalting humanity. God's plan is displaying his glory through the righteous and unrighteous. Remember, when someone creates something, they do they create it for a purpose. So the question is, what's God's purpose for creating Adam and Eve? Right? I mean, if you create something, if you build something or make something, you're doing it so that it has a function. What's the function? Right. Well, the function is that God will be glorified both through their judgment and through their redemption. Okay, that makes sense. And the problem today is we are so man-centered and narcissistic. Well, God should have created mankind to glorify man. And God should have created mankind so that man is always, you know, on the, in the right and always doing good and always, you know, never suffering. That's the only fair thing to do. Then God's going, no, those who are in hell will glorify my the my uh, character of judgment and holiness and righteousness and those who are in heaven will glorify my redemption my mercy and my grace and if you have any doubt of that let me remind you what we what we read in Romans Again, I'll back all of this up through scripture. You will say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? But who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? 
will what is formed say to who formed it or the created say to the creator? Why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over the clay to make the same lump, one piece for honor and the other piece for dishonor? And what if God wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known endured with much patience the objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory? So, I make this statement, but I'm backing it up with scripture. God created humanity for his own reasons, and his reasons are to glorify himself. And get this, let us bring this all into perspective. Now look at me again, class, look at me all. God is most glorified when you are most satisfied. In him. God's glory and your satisfaction and fulfillment are not at odds. God created you to be most happy, joyful, and fulfilled when you are glorifying him. Now, you can say, heck with that. I don't like that plan. And you can destroy your life and ruin it because you're now operating in a way that you weren't created to, to exist. Or you can yield to the glory of God, embrace it, and say, I was created to bring God glory, and when I bring God glory, that's when I'm most happy. Mm -hmm. That's your choice. Mm -hmm. So what are the people in hell... <clears throat> um saying ouch yeah but but no are they saying i you know the lump of clay that was designed for dishonor well first of all there's no one in hell right now right okay right they're in hades they're in a place of judgment of waiting for their okay. um there is they're, they are realizing they're, they're wrong. They're, they are in great regret and remorse over their wasted life, which is worse. I mean, you know, what's worse, to hold on to your stubborn attitude for eternity or to finally realize, which you're going to have to, that you were wrong and have regret and remorse and shame and contempt for eternity. But we would all be there if it wasn't that God had sustained us. That's right. So I know that, that he has purposes that we just don't know about, but I just wonder. Um, they have regret, but they, they couldn't have come to Christ out of their own choice anyway. Well, no one could have, but that doesn't relinquish them of their responsibility of sin. Right. And, and here's the other thing, okay? And I said this before, and I'll say this again. God, it's God who chooses and elects people for salvation. Right. But we do not know how God does that. It would be foolish of us to assume that God capriciously or randomly chooses some for hell and some for heaven. You don't know how God elects. Right. You no, know he does, right? right. So, so when the Bible says God desires all men to be saved, you have to reconcile that with election. So right. here's what I'm going to say. Here's what I told one of my students, bless her little heart. She came to me in tears <laughs> when we were on mission trip. She said, it's not fair that God sends people to hell, people that haven't even heard the gospel. And you know, she said, I'm not mocking her. She was really, you know, sweet. And, and I just, you know, held her and let her cry. And then I said, are you really this heartbroken? 
over people not hearing the yeah. I said, then go tell them. Go tell them. You know, people say, oh, it's not fair for God not to save every. No, what's not fair is that we're so indulged in our own narcissistic lives and agendas that we don't take the time to share the gospel with anyone around us. And come on, let's be honest. So let's not get on our high horse about how God isn't merciful enough when we are not even willing to share the gospel with the people we come in contact with. Shame on us, not God, on us. <clears throat> Tony, does, we've talked a lot about uh, Satan being deceived he's deceived himself. Um, here we are talking about what we know about Satan. There's so much more to know, but he just doesn't believe what we say. He doesn't believe how, how, what the Bible says about him. No, I think that he knows his judgment is coming. Um, cause I think the Bible indicates that, but at this point, he may be so filled with hate, he's just like, I'm going to do as much damage as I can on the way down. Out of just sheer hatred. Because remember, you know, you look at people like Adolf Hitler and Stalin and Mao Zedong and these guys, you know, um, sin goes in certain stages. Remember, Romans talks about that. And yeah. you get to the point where you don't even care that you are worthy of death. You just want others to die with you. And I think that's probably where he's at. Because remember, the demons, what did they say to Jesus? Have you come to judge us before our time? So they fully expect to be judged. Right? So that's a giveaway right there. That's a giveaway. That verse is a giveaway that they know what's coming. Right. And by the way, every unsaved human heart also knows what's coming. Tony, where's what's the verse that um, that reference to what you talked about saying Hades is not hell, but a place of judgment. Um, I think you'd have to go to the rich man and Lazarus. Because that's where I'm at. And it says on Luke 20, uh, verse 23, says in Hades, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. And so Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Right. But then you but to go, me, that doesn't sound like a, 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 you know, interim spot. Okay, right. But then you go over to Revelation 20, verse 14, and it says death and Hades, right? You were just talking about Hades? Yeah. It says, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So that distinguishes a difference between Hades and hell. Because Hades is thrown in to hell. So is that where the Roman Catholic Church gets their purgatory from? <laughs> no, they get purgatory from um, apocryphal writings that are not inspired. And, and by the way, uh, the whole uh, purgatory thing was a way for the Catholic Church to keep its hold over people. To make them pay the church money to get out of purgatory sooner. Sooner. <laughs> they, they were the original. Until now. <laughs> the, the Catholic Church the Catholic, Benny Hinn didn't, doesn't have anything on the Catholic Church. 
They all know how to raise money. So, <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to wait for someone. She muted herself. I've never seen Cindy mute herself before. That never happens. That never happens. Never. <laughs> Write this down, people. <laughs> recording everything no cindy i'm gonna tell you, cindy i'm gonna tell you uh just why i appreciate your questions so much one the questions that you ask are thoughtful and i think they're they're in depth i think they're good they pr promote good conversation but also i think the, the biggest reason why i like your questions is that i know that you and dave are investing your lives in the gospel and that means a lot to me thank you i have a question yes lee okay when when everything is over and and god throws um satan into the lake of fire he throws everything into the lake of fire death and hades and anyone who's not written in the book of life okay and that's going to last forever the lake of fire yes no it's not ever going to stop burning and those people are going to be there yes wow because humans are humans are created with an eternal soul yeah and I've often asked myself, why is it a lake of fire? Why is it so bad? Well, they won't be able to sin or even think of sin. Yeah. And they won't be able to die. And they won't be able to die. It'll that's, be death forever. Yeah. And that's what's so sad. It, it, you know what? And that should move us to share the gospel. Yeah. I told my friend, I was trying to, you know, give him scripture. And he says, eh, I don't believe all that. <laughs> and I, and, and, you know, and I kept trying to convince him. And finally I said to him, he, he says, when you die, you die and that's it, you're gone. And I said, well, if, if I, if you are right, I have nothing to lose because when my life is over, I'm dead. I don't have to worry about hell. But if you're wrong, you're going to spend your eternity in hell with no way. And he says, eh, I don't believe that. <laughs> it's sad. It's sad. Yeah. I, he's yeah. been my friend for over 30 years. And, and I would say... At some point, that's where prayer and fasting and those things come in to be concerned in yeah. regards to um, yeah. the people's salvation. So when we pray to God that God would reveal himself to those we love who don't know him, I mean, and it's, we really are putting the ball in God's court. Well, you are, and you're surrendering your will to God's act of grace. But it's your responsibility to do that. Tony, when... Um... <clears throat> I know all of this brings glory to God. And, and when we trust Christ or actually he draws us, we have no choice. Um, we, our greatest desire is to glorify him. Um, now, I think my question is to glorify him or to show him um, bring him to the forefront, glorify, what 
in front of who? Well, I think uh, the, the, the glorification is in front of all creation because that's what you see at the, at the seat of Christ is all creation glorifying, glorifying God. And you say, well, why? And here's the big question. Why does God want to be glorified? I mean, he knows who he is. This is not someone that has an identity crisis. Mm -hmm. So why does God want to be glorified? Here's, I think, what the answer is. Because to experience and acknowledge and embrace the glory of God brings such joy to his creation. This is the part I think that we miss. Mm. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I agree. God is a God of love and he takes great joy to see his creation revel in his glory because he knows that is what's gonna bring them ultimate joy and satisfaction. We tend to think of this thing because of our own sinfulness to glorify someone means we have to demean ourselves. Hmm. God isn't after us demeaning ourselves. Humility does not mean to demean yourself. Humility simply, the biblical definition of humility is to see yourself as God sees you or to see yourself realistically. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's what humility is. God's not out to demean anybody. But God does want us to know the joy of living in union with him. And I, I think that's huge. I think we miss that. We think either that, that salvation is all about pleasing our flesh, like the Benny Hens of this world. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like the Westboro Baptist Church, salvation is all about, you know, judging everybody and hating everybody and life and demeaning oneself but the truth is we have been created in the image of god that's an amazing thing that's not a small thing that's an amazing thing so if we've been created in the image of god how do we protect that image in the way we live in the way we think and in the way we express ourselves. I agree with you, Tony, when you say that um, we are, we get the most joy uh, it, within ourselves um, the closer we, we experience, or the closer we get to the Lord, you know, as we experience him, that's our greatest joy. And, you know, when we, build up the courage or the faith in that process of sanctification the holy spirit and we speak or sing our hearts out so that our brothers and sisters can also within the spirit connection it encourages others when we see the faith of one of our brothers and sisters stat just be spoken out there whatever form that they were gifted at whether it be singing or preaching or just uh you know i think it's for our brothers and sisters to and to glorify god so we i think it just kind of all works together yeah that you know one of the things i've always said is that Part of the importance of participating in the body of Christ locally is that your spiritual gifts are, should be being used to sanctify other believers and their gifts sanctify you or help you in your sanctification. 
And that's one of the things that I, um, that really disturbs me in regards to churches losing focus on a proper ecclesiology. What is the biblical function of the church? And I think in America today, the reason why we're in the place we're in is because many churches do not function in a biblical manner. One of the reasons, I think there's other reasons. Well, Tony, I really like um, these two points you made. One, that God is most glorified when you are satisfied with him that kind of went together with the first point you made, which was, I'm reading from my notes, you, um, you get angry because your will is not being done. How we respond real, reveals how much you do not trust God. So those two kind of go together because when we trust God, we are very satisfied with him. I mean, why shouldn't we be? And then if God is most glorified, but if when we're just going, oh, I'm angry about this, that, or the other thing, right? That shows that we're not satisfied with God. We're not satisfied that God can do what he needs to do to get us through whatever it is. And that's not great for, well, God's probably not happy with it. And it doesn't make us happy either because we're just, you know, you know, upset about something that didn't go our way, right? Well, I think the challenge is, is that we trust, we can trust God on the big things of our life, our salvation and destiny and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it comes, you know, when you see your kid uh, walking across your, your patio with leaking paint, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're like, ah, you know, and it's, True. it's learning, it, it really is learning to trust God in the micro parts of your life as well as the macro parts of your life. And I think that's, in fact, I think that is much harder to do. Um, and that is where the real Christian maturity comes when we can trust God in the very small things. Remember, Jesus said, eh, he who is faithful in little is faithful in much. There's a reason why he said that. It's the little things, you know, is that the big, it's easy to, uh, you know, you know, uh, deny Jesus or get on the boxcar. Okay, well, I'm getting on the boxcar. Um, or, you know, your kid dragging wet paint through your brand new tile job. You know, so, <laughs> you know it's, it's the little things that get you. <laughs> yeah. I wanna, so I wanna, I wanna uh, just emphasize this quote, you know, this is from Christian Hiddenism from uh, John Piper, right? You have to look at the preposition here. It's not with him, it's in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. In him. So it's not like, oh, yeah, you know, I don't really like you. That's like, you know, the, with you. And just of, just yeah. to clarify, I've made sure you know that that was a John Piper quote before. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've said yeah. this before, that that is a Piper quote. May I, hey, here, may, may I have a question for, for our pastor? Um, Pastor Tony. Pastor Tony, Pastor Tony yeah. she's got a My question. My question is, God left Satan free will to, to do those things, things like, uh, um, like uh, he can go around from the earth to the heaven to deceive people, the human being in the earth, and uh, can accuse human being in the heaven before God. And uh, I, to, to me, I'm not afraid, afraid of Satan because God's salvation is a mystery to me. And, uh, but I can trust in God by my faith without doubt. And uh, my question to the mystery of God, create this create, creation is God also make, make the, the angels. And one of the most bright angels far defective and who becomes Satan and who is doing those things, evil things. And why, why Satan have free will? Okay, was the question why does Satan exist, basically? Why, why does Satan have free will to deceive oh, people say, well, and accuse a human being? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, you know, the, the, 
the spiritual condition of Satan. I don't know if he has a free will. I think he's captive to his own deceptions. I don't think when you're in sin without the grace of God, I think having a free will is something that has to entail having the grace of God in, in your life. If God's grace isn't in your life, I don't think your will is free at all. You can only sin. And Satan, obviously, only seems to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Good question, Sharon. Did I, did I answer it? I didn't. Yes. yes, yes. Okay. I, didn't, I wasn't. I was trying to catch everything. It's, catch it's everything. too. It's a very mystery to me. And always, I think every day I think about how God creation and how God allow and the deceit and Look, all kind of. There's there's two ways to view creation. Either God created and lost control of everything, or God created things and they went just as He planned. Mm -hmm. Those are your only two choices. Okay, thank you. So I have a controversial question. Who's that? Um, oh, okay. Man. okay. Everyone says, um, they use the phrase, God is in control. And they use this phrase all the time. But I don't think there's anywhere, no verse that I can remember, and I've been in my share of Bible studies, but I, I literally, you know, who knows? And you guys might know um, where that is is written in the Bible. When I say that, I don't mean that God is not in control. I mean that God is not controlling it. It'd be like if you owned a company and your company, you're the owner, you know, you're the, the controller, basically. You own it. Maybe you're even the manager, but you don't really control the, all the things going on in that company. You don't, things. I mean, the, there are things happening that are not, that you're not controlling. So they say God is in control, but that makes it sound like God's controlling things. God's not controlling things. Three well, wills that God's not controlling things. Well, and here's, I, yeah, I, I think there's two different words there. I think we need to differentiate. One is the word control, and the other is the word sovereignty. Okay? When you say God is in control of everything, you're saying, oh, that person that went over and murdered that family, God was controlling them to do so. Okay? We all know that James says that God, God cannot be tempted with sin, nor does he tempt with sin. So that would say, well, that's stupid. You know, God doesn't make anyone sin. Now, when you say God is sovereign, that's different. You say that, per the, that person went over and committed that sin. Um, God withheld his grace from keeping that person from doing so. God is not obligated to enact his grace or spiritual control on someone. So God is sovereign in that everything is according to his plan, yet God doesn't make people sin, but he simply allows them to go their own sinful way, and he doesn't exert grace on their life to keep them from sinning. Here is a perfect example of that. In the book of Exodus, God tells Moses, go down into Egypt and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Okay, now five times it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart and five times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Exactly. That's, well, that's a good way to... But here's the thing. How does God harden your heart? God hardens your heart by simply allowing you to continue in your sin. So it is possible for Pharaoh to harden his heart, and at the same time, God is hardening his heart. Pharaoh, in his sin, decides to keep sinning, and God decides not to give Pharaoh the grace 
to see the truth, but allows him to continue in his sin. So both are true. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's the difference between control and sovereignty. God did not make Pharaoh sin. God simply just didn't keep him from sinning. He can do both. He can do an act that's specific or people are doing their own acts that are specific. But It's a passive, know. active thing. You know, it really is. But God will never make anyone sin but he can keep you from sinning. Just like when Abraham went to Egypt and the Pharaoh took Sarah as his wife and Abraham lied and said, this is my sister. And the Pharaoh, you know, God came to Pharaoh and said, I'm going to kill you. And he said, whoa, 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 wait. I didn't do anything wrong. He told me it was his sister, not his wife. And God said, yes, and that's why I'm going to spare your life because of the integrity of your heart. You weren't trying to sin. And then God says, what? And because of that, I kept you from having sex with her. So God kept Pharaoh from sinning. That's what I'm talking about. The difference between sovereignty and control. that makes sense hopefully it does i think it does I, I it's an interesting topic that i think someone could go on and on with you know but it's i think that's a a good way of looking at it that's another you know that's an, an I, over think, I think for a lot of believers and they really haven't thought this through um, yeah so it, it takes some time to digest it and to you know um, I know that when I first started meeting with Pat, it took him about four or five weeks before he finally, but when it clicked, it clicked. And I was like, okay, that's it. I, and it starts unlocking all these, all this knowledge that he had, but he right. didn't have access to because he didn't have the right theological key. All of a sudden it all starts falling into place. Just yeah. like Paul, you know, Paul's like this really educated guy, but he didn't have the right theological key until he was saved. And then all of a sudden, boom, well, you know, how could Paul go from being a horrible person to preaching uh, almost supernaturally in one or two days? Well, because he already had all the knowledge. He just didn't have the right theological key. And ever since then, I've been freaking out and not getting any sleep ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a question for you then. Um, the notion of um, God's permissive will versus perfect will, not that they oppose each other, they're, they're both kind of equal, but is that more of a, a theological construct that we come up with to understand than, than actually something out of biblical doctrine? Well, I think it's something, to, really, I think it's something that describes this issue between control and sovereignty. That God's permissive will is that where he says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, some people will say, hold on, the context of that verse is dealing with God's elect. So God's not willing that any elect should perish, but that all the elect should come to repentance. And actually, I agree with that because that is the context. But you got this other verse that said, God desires all people to be saved. And the word there is pos in the Greek, which means universal. It doesn't mean the elect only, it means everyone. So how do you balance that? That's the permissive versus sovereign will of God or perfect will of God. God desires everyone to be saved because the character of his love and mercy but in God's sovereign will not everyone is going to be saved because the the goal here is to glorify him both in heaven and in hell does that make sense I try yeah and I 
it, it doesn't make sense, and, but it's something to think about over you know a long period of time. I think these complex questions make my brain. We have a warm welcome. You sleep tonight. <laughs> Tony, that's what we pay you for, except that, oh yeah, we don't pay you, do we? Uh, never mind. <laughs> Plant that seed of faith, brother. <laughs> Here, I got, a, I got a prayer cloth for you, <laughs> dipped in the Jordan River. <laughs> Wave it over your checkbook, you'll be a millionaire. <laughs> Tony, is there any evidence in scripture or anything that uh, sticks out that would would um, speak to the fact that this you this world is what God is doing in our world is um, or our on our planet there are other things that He's doing on other planets. No, that no, no, He is not doing that, or we don't know. What's well, okay. According to scripture, there's no mention of that. So there's no reason for us to think that he's doing that. To think that he is doing that is fantasy, imagination, and conjecture. I, I'm just, I mean, it, it's a waste of time. Because if God doesn't speak to it, why bother yourself with it? Okay. And I think all this talk about aliens, I think it's, I think what we're seeing in the skies, it's undeniable. We're, you know, even our Air Force is like, these things are just zipping around the jets. And it's not the Chinese and it's not the Russians. I think it's demonic. I think we're beginning to see the demonic realm invade as the earth gets more and more ungodly. It's opening that door to the demonic realm wider and wider. And I think that's what we're seeing. That's my opinion, my opinion. Because in Revelation, it says you will see signs in the sky. I thought they were godly signs. Not necessarily. A sign I, is uh -huh. an, what the word means is an indication. Well, that is an indication that things are not going so good. And that's exactly what the end times are supposed to be about. Right. So not every sign is a positive thing. And remember, when we talk about God's sovereignty, that the, the demonic realm could not invade the way it's invading unless God gave it permission to do so. Right. So it is, in fact, a sign by God. Okay. Okay. That, well, that's my opinion. I look, I'm not, you know, it's my opinion. Period. <laughs> well, I, I understand that that it's not in the Bible. God makes no mention of it. Um, and so it's, I guess it is a waste of time. I guess it's just, I just wondered if in scripture there was any indication of that that I haven't come uh, across. No. Nope. Just think of how <clears throat> precious we are because God created the entire universe just for us. Have you ever thought of it that way? Not for aliens, not for, yeah. I think God created the entire universe to glorify himself. I mean, yeah, right. And in so doing, mm -hmm. he created the universe and created us with the ability to look into the universe and discover his glory. Um, speaking, I'm just kind of on the other end of that, um, and this might be a topic that's for another session, but just the idea of, I, I would be like to know your opinion, um, Tony, about, you know, the uh, you know the thing about evolution and neanderthal man and all this kind of stuff in the bible and how that fits in well my wife might find some agreement with evolution when she you know has to live with me on a daily basis <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know. okay evolution is stupid it's not scientifically it's not scientific 
and it's not, it can't be scientifically upheld. No scientist worth their salt would ever put their bet on it. There's too much that we know now about human biology that actually disproves the theory of evolution, which is why they're looking, I mean, our schools are like 60 years behind the times. It's just ridiculous. The, the whole evolution gambit is so, uh, it, it's, it's a cult. It's a religion. You have to believe it when there's absolutely, not only is there no proof for it, but there's all sorts of proof against it. And you have to believe it. That's a religion. Well, what about those, I mean, and I don't know too much about it because I never was really into it, but, you know, what about, like, they said they found Neanderthal man and Piltdown man and all these different ones, you know, what is, what did they find? Neanderthal man was found to be a person who had severe arthritis. Uh, <laughs> Nebraska man, Nebraska man's my favorite. A pig's tooth, right? Nebraska One man? tooth. One tooth. They found one tooth and made an entire caveman family out of it, called it Nebraska Man. And it turns out now that we have DNA, it was a pig's tooth. Oh. So that's what I mean. When yeah, you start, yeah, that makes sense. When you start looking into evolution, you realize just how much fraud, plain fraud and lying, uh, it's just stupid. To believe in evolution, you have to be a moron. Hey, Tony, on that note, um, there's these really good books by Lee Strobel, who explains exactly what you're saying on, you know, we just know so much scientifically now that just um, the evolution. That makes sense, yeah. Even, yeah, they're really good. And they, they, they write them for like college level to make it more simplified and clear. But it's, yeah, the stuff in our schools very the um, what's interesting now is as science has progressed they're they're going away from evolution and they're going to aliens that aliens planted life here so guess what folks all these lights in the skies and aliens i mean they're setting up a whole demonic fraud to happen like scientology you know it's just there's Scientology out there going on. I agree. You know, that's a very strong group. Okay, before you guys start messing with Scientology and talking about the Scientology, as a third level Thetan, I would like to say, knock it off. <laughs> Tom and I are like this, all right? And I've been cleared, totally cleared. I'm cleared. <laughs> Hey, you guys watch Leah Remini? Yes. Uh, I'm watching. <laughs> she was I'm a lifelong thing. Scientologist. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're in a religion that was written by a science fiction writer, and he wasn't even a good science fiction writer. And one year before he, he uh, created Scientology, he was quoted as saying, if you want to get rich, start a religion. Start a religion, yeah. No, he mm. he knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Amazing. Words Excuse up. me for a second. I'm sorry. It's it's after nine. In fact, we've gone seven minutes over time, and I want to give people the opportunity to bug out if they're ready to go, and also give Tony a chance to go hang out with his wife. Yes. Hey, how you doing? Okay. Tony, you sure handled the fire squad of questions. <laughs> it was very. <laughs> really i got a lot of topic but really very interesting well good um we will continue on to uh john 4 10. oh sure we will <laughs> oh sure <laughs> well, i promise <laughs> promises promises um, empty promises <laughs> no. tony would you be so good as to pray us out i will and then okay. i must Father, thank you for this time in the word. Lord, we thank you for these uh, diversions that take us really into looking to the character and identity of your son, which is so important to understand. And Father, that we can have a good theological grounding, but more than that, understand the issue of sanctification, our need for it, our need to witness to those around us, 
And Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.